On the third Thursday of every month, pastors and church leaders from near and far gather together for a time of friendship, gospel encouragement, and ministry insights in the warehouse at the Axis Church in downtown Nashville. The following is from one such third Thursday gathering. So Gordon, who, who went to Asbury, has been looking at, uh, through his ministry, through movements around the world. Um, he acknowledged there were no uh, salvation movements in North America. So he's drawn to Asbury, and his experience has been um, repentance and a fear of the Lord, a good fear of the Lord and holiness. Gordon, do you like the term revival associated with Asbury? Is that the term you would choose, or is there another term that you would choose? This is the story that I would just tell in three hours, which felt like 25 minutes. Um, All that I, um, do I like the word revival? What I saw was that that day that I went up on a Saturday, I'm, and here's and you'll be able to relate, relate with this. I was trying to figure out like just how many people are here in this space because we couldn't get into any of the venues. It was only restricted to 25 and younger. And um, and I looked out and I kept thinking, well, the Beach High School, Hendersonville, you know, uh, me, uh, football. I've gone to hundreds and hundreds of high school football games on Friday night, and it was like three times that size. So it had to be. 10,000, 15,000, 18, I, I don't know. It was a ton of people, not including this mile, this 15, 20 minute walk through a line. I couldn't ever get to the front. But what I saw was there was a moment where <clears throat> they were hearing young people come down and they were, and as, as they were praying, this is being telecasted, you know, had a little something out in the quad. And they just paused and said, hey, here's what we've been hearing through prayer is that there's been hurt in the church that this generation has been hurt in the church. And we think we need to respond to that. And I'm just telling you the story to come back to this word revival. It, it What happened was uh, uh, an older gentleman in his 70s, and all of this was not governed and certainly not directed or scheduled, but it was being sensitive to the spirit and, and being yielded to the spirit. And what happened there in that moment was they said, we feel like we need to repent. And, and they identified an older gentleman, snow white hair in his seventies said, and I think he might've been the head of a denomination, but anyway, he got the mic and said, I'm not head of a denomination, but he was so grandfatherly, so tender, so careful, so loving and cautious and said on behalf of the church. And he, I I can't be as eloquent and, and relive that moment at all, but on behalf of the church, we repent. And on mass, as if rehearsed out in the grass, muddy grass area, all 10,000 people went, went to their knees and on their faces. And it was so deafening, deafeningly quiet, all you could hear is wind. And I literally thought that when I went down on my knees, like everybody else, and literally on our faces, that I thought, well, maybe something... Uh, stopped up my ears because I couldn't hear anybody at anything. No rustling, no clamoring, no whispering. And then I looked up just to make sure, like, am I going to lose my hair? And just en masse, thousands of people. And then there was lamenting. uh, And then there was wailing and repentance. And um, that was exceptional. So revival, the word revival I, I sense that people were there who had been in churches that they longed to see come to life and be yielded to the Spirit, but couldn't do that in their own churches. And so they went to seek it out among people who were yearning like them. It's like the 2% here, the 2% there, the 2% there said, gather quickly. So I'm sorry. Thanks. I didn't mean to co opt that. No, it's great. Great to hear your experience and how fresh that is still on you. Who else in here may have, uh, I know one other person for sure, had actually went to that physical place? Is there anyone else? Raise their hand so we can know. And that, didn't you go? I didn't know if that was that person. 
No, no, no. I'm asking a survey. This is a survey. If you're in this room right now, and you raise your hand if you actually went. Okay, so good. So I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll come back around when you're ready on that. So in case you just overlooked this, the very definition of the word revival dictionary, you, you look at the word vive, that's a life. So the bring back to life. I'm sure most of us knew that, but me, sometimes I, I overlook the obvious. So that's kind of where this word is, to bring back to life, to bring back uh, to spiritual spiritual life. So, you know, look, looking at some of this, here, here's, who else wants to talk about the definition of revival um, before I move to another question, if you want to? I would say that the definition of revival at least as understood with like, you know, the Great Awakenings and, you know, Billy Graham Crusades and, you know, things like that would be a mass reorientation within the culture towards Jesus, towards the gospel, and toward the church. I would use that as a definition towards revival. And also as far as Asbury being a revival, if I had to deterministically say yes or no, I honestly would say no. I do think Asbury, you know, is a good thing for the church, and I do think it can be a re-empowerment. A mass repentance of, you know, people towards Jesus is a good thing. But Asbury re-empowering the church, while I do see that as something that the Spirit is doing within our culture, I'm a little bit hesitant if I would say that is a revival although that may just be me being semantic about the specific definition of the word revival. Yeah, I, th- I think that there is a lot of that semantics, and, and we have various definitions, which makes this discussion important. I don't know if I'm going to try to define it <clears throat> as much as maybe bring some thoughts into the conversation. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones Jones book, Unspeakable Joy, he talks about how being filled with the Spirit is your emotions being saturated with the joy of the Lord and the joy of your salvation. And, and so it's not just a scent anymore. It's like your entire being is saturated with an awareness and a joy and where your emotions are like, like a sponge. They take in good, you know, good godly emotions and you're, you're just fully aware and full of life in that way. And, and I think the verse that I think speaks to that is Galatians 4, 6. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but, but a son, and if a son, an heir through God. So I think it's that, that Abba cry, that awareness of God's love, that awareness of the Father's heart. And I think the 18th century revival speaks to that, where John Wesley had his heart strangely warmed, which was really the witness of the spirit, and then you have George Whitfield preaching the new birth, uh, which again was really around this text. So for what it's worth, I think those things can speak to that. Yeah, and and I, I, I like that you're, you're saying, hey, the fact that some were emotional is not a bad thing. We're whole beings and the, the Lord, our joy of our salvation. So pulling Dr. Jones in on that is interesting. Who else might, what is revival? Any any other questions? And I think it's okay to have different semantics. I mean, I, I do think I'm okay with the word revival attached to Asbury, but it doesn't bother me that you're not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, again, it's not clear cut. And I think these discussions help us move forward. And by the end of this discussion, I may not, I may agree with you. All right. So then just moving us along, that what interests you is revival then. Of course, we don't even have a definition of revi- revival, do we? <laughs> a shared definition, but, but I think we have a functional, uh, there's some agreement, as you'll see, different movements in our nation. Is revival for believers or unbelievers? And is this, is this even an important distinction for that? It, you know, I know the answer is both. So we know that answer, but I'm not asking you that. I'm asking you to actually talk through, you know, is revival for believers or unbelievers? When we, if you grew up, you know, if you grew up uh, in America in the 80s and 90s, 
and were part of a church, most evangelical churches. We had revival twice a year, invite your friends. So that felt evangelistic. But then, you know, I'm looking at some of these, the Jews in the Old Testament, Book of Acts, it seems like believers are calling them to repentance and, and even Gordon's uh, definition, and I'm sorry, your name slipped my mind, and Bill's definition, the church turning back. Just who, who, who might have comment on that? And is that even a relevant question or is that just a waste of our time? To, so I'm going back to the person in your church who says, what this church needs is a revival. What, do, what, are, what, what are they thinking what do they mean? How can we get some common parallel language so that we're all praying the same direction? Sorry about that. Any thoughts on that? Okay. Cole and then Beth. It's Cole, right? Yeah. Well, this is just a, a book that I read. Um, Nathaniel Philbrick, the historian, wrote a book called Mayflower. And um, the generation that came over on the Mayflower were, if I remember correctly his writing were all committed to religious liberty and they they were seeking uh, the city on the hill and they wanted in the new world the freedom to practice their religious convictions the people of conviction came over on the mayflower but within a generation or two their kids and grandkids were largely unconverted so it had not it had not passed on um, the parents were very committed and then the ones coming behind them were not, which is, is interesting when you look at the dating then of the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening. You're dealing with those generations. So just the point to how it's both, you, you had b the children of believers, uh, some of whom were just lapsed in their faith, some of whom were not of faith at all. And when these awakenings happened, it's, it's moving through people who had some sort, sense of God uh, and yet weren't necessarily, you know, connected or related to him through Christ. And then the way, the awakenings brought that. Yeah. So that, was just, that made me think of that uh, history. Yeah. I just think that um, the very nature of the the technical definition of revival to bring back to life or to breathe new life. If someone, to me, if someone in a church says we, what this church needs is revival, probably they're speaking to an apathy or a sleepiness that has fallen over that congregation and they want something to come in and breathe fresh life into your awareness, your very perception of the, of God and in all of those facets um, that we've already talked about, his holiness, his um, redemptive, you know, nature, everything like that. I think sometimes being alive looks like um, Asbury. It looks like a stillness and a and an awe, a repentance and a holiness. Sometimes being alive is dancing before the Lord or, you know, just having a rejuvenation in your spirit. So I don't know. I think don't put it in a box. Uh, I don't know if you know who Claude King is. He wrote Experiencing God with Henry Blackaby. And uh, he's released something called Return to Me. And I think that's what I would say revival encapsulates. It's a turning to and a returning to. Um, just what, Beth, what you were saying, uh, a lot. Uh, which I always think I always think it's it involves repentance and a um, and grasping my lowest state and the holiness of God and the gap and the and the gift of grace and mercy of Jesus seeing him fresh and new praising that um, bowing to that uh, and I think returning sounds better in yeah. some ways. Can I share something too? Um, you know, uh, I was approached because I was I was in Clarksville as my first year planting, and I have I have a dear friend of mine who is in a more conservative tradition, and he said to me, "Do you want to be a part of this revival that we're doing?" And I was like, "Well, let's talk about." It. And I said, "What what do you mean by revival? Like, if I'm going to involve our budding church plant and 
it's still trying to get established in Clarksville and partner with a few other churches. Like, what does that, what does that mean? You know, and I think maybe the, the point of me sharing the story is that I think we have to understand what other people think it means and, and maybe some misconceptions about it. Because I think, Beth, what you said is that it really resonates with this idea of people sense an apathy. And I think a lot of times people want a silver bullet in their church. And they say, man, when they hear these amazing stories of the great awakening of the grandchildren of those who founded this country. And, you know, they hear Martin Luther jones they read Leonard Ravenhill, Why Revival Terries, and, and then they say, let's get this silver bullet. We get enough preachers in, and we get enough something to get the apathy out without actually having to do the real work of repentance and faith. And like Eugene Peterson says, you know, long obedience in the same direction. So... You know, Beth, especially what you said resonates with this idea of sometimes it looks like an Asbury, but sometimes it looks like slow, steady, faithful pastoring over 10 years in a dying church to care for these people and shepherd their souls. So I think, I don't know if, if, if revival, as we're discussing it here, needs to look like any of these things. You know, it could be for Christians to get relived, you know, revived. It could mean a, a massive amounts of people repenting and believing the gospel for the first time, but... You know, I just talked with his friend, and he's a dear friend. He still is. But I'm just like, so so who are you inviting to this revival? And he said, I said, what's the purpose of it? He's like, well, we want to see people come to Jesus. I said, so who are you inviting? A bunch of Christians. And he's got, like, a gospel choir coming in with a bunch of people playing banjos and, like, in a gospel choir. And, like, you know, I was just like, like so you, you want unbelievers to come to this? And he's like, well, no, no, not necessarily. I think it's more of just like getting our people revived so that they got to share the gospel. I said, okay, well, has it ever worked? I said, if you've done something in Clarksville, has you ever, do you have any metrics to track whether or not this has ever really worked? And he's like, he literally looked at me and said, he was a Clarksville guy, and he said, no. I said, have you noticed any difference? He's like, no. So... You know, it's not to be critical of the idea of a revival, but I think long obedience, same direction can be a revival. I think these experiences with Asbury can, but it's not, I don't think we should look at it anywhere like a silver bullet. I think Jesus is the silver bullet. His gospel is the silver bullet, however that, however that plays out. Man, you guys are so smart. I'm learning a lot from this side of the room. I'm not even getting to this side of the room. <laughs> I know you guys are just, I know you're, you, you've got stuff. It's just revving up inside of you. Uh, so Gordon and Beth both kind of talked about the church, people hungry in the church. Gordon, I like your 2%, the 2% all gathering into this physical location. I think there could be some truth to that. Um, Cole, I really appreciate you helping define my question better. It, it literally is historically both. And I think about almost like pre-Christian people think about, um, Acts chapter 19, these disciples of John, oh, we, we haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. So it's kind of like these second and third generation Christians, hey, we want to experience it ourselves. And, and so we're, we're seeing that. So that, that's very, very helpful. Very, very helpful. What is revival? What is revival? Okay. So revival is for, I think we've kind of somewhat agreed for believers, but it's impacting unbelievers. And we, we can see that, we can feel that. So let's talk about the American examples of revival. We touched into this already. These are, um, the first two are his, historically part of our American history. Someone in a public school would study this. Uh, the Great Awakening in the 1720s through 1740s, uh, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield. Evidently, our, our country, the colonies, we weren't a country yet, but the colonies were irreligious. Had, you know, church participation was low. The men were at the taverns and, you know, drunk and not doing their responsibilities. That, that was characteristic. And this revival brought people back to the Lord. And then the Second Great Awakening, interestingly enough, centered around Kentucky um, not far from here is the beginning of the Second Great Awakening uh, at the Red River Revival, and then it went on to northeast of Lexington in the um, Cane Ridge Revival. And then um, those are kind of the main two. So I just wanted to spend some time. Uh, if there's any insight we can learn from those, we've already heard from Cole, um, the grandkids, great-grandkids of Mayflower and, and, and the Puritans. 
Uh, I know that um, you've done some study on the Second Great Awakening, and, and this is Jacob. We've, we've talked about this at the water cooler, so uh, I've benefited from it. So if you want to talk a little bit about your perspective on that. Yeah, I mean, um, well, this is much louder than what I thought it was. Um, but yeah, Red River Meeting House, uh, which is in uh, Kentucky. Um, there's actually a really good book by church historians called The Religion of the American South. Uh, I think even in the context of definitions, you have to not only define revival, but you have to define revival uh, based off of the ethnography of, of where you're coming from. Uh, and in the American South, um, it's it's definitely different uh, than the American North or anything like that. Um, but pre um, Pre-Second Great Awakening, uh, the people of God were uh, very, I mean, you had the gold rush. A lot of people were moving to the West. Uh, and in that, uh, you started having a, um, I guess, pun intended, a rush of, of greed and focus uh, in that. And um, during that time, uh, the Presbyterians now claim uh, the a campground, but uh, Great River Meeting House was a space uh, where uh, people, uh, to what my brother was saying in the back over there, where it was just a space of repentance, um, where he was saying that, hey, all of us in, in the American South are moving to the West because we want more money. And he said, we can't do that anymore. Uh, we got to repent. And there was this, this space at Red River Meeting House where there, uh, to Josh's point, they were calling all the preachers, but this is really key. Please hear this. Uh, they were waiting for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit to, to happen in the center where all these big preachers were. Uh, please keep in mind, uh, this is uh, during the times of slavery. Um, so when you came to a revival, everyone packed up their entire livelihood. They packed up their clothes. They packed up their slaves. They packed up everything, mules, everything, just to get to Red River Meeting House because that's where the Lord was. Um, but as soon as you got to the, the, the gates of Red River Meeting House, everything you'd leave behind, all your property, including slaves, um, and they were not allowed to enter. Uh, into uh, where God was going to move. Because revivals in the American South, I'm just going to be really blunt with it, revivals are not what we're uh, seeing or talking about right now. Revivals are just an opportunity for bankers to come in as soon as you get baptized, get a bank account kind of thing. Um, that's just what we saw uh, in the, the history of the American South. Uh, but during this time, as they were waiting for uh, Holy Spirit to fall and outpouring the Holy Spirit, this was so beautiful. Uh, on the outskirts uh, of the campground were all these stumps, and you can actually see them to this day. Uh, out of nowhere, uh, these black girls uh, were got up on the stumps, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, and just started to prophesy the gospel of Jesus. Uh, all the white men in the center are like, where's the Holy Spirit? Where's the Holy Spirit? And these, these black slave girls are preaching on the stumps, on the outskirts, just the gospel of Jesus that we need to repent. It's called a holiness. Um, and uh, that led, instead of a center point going outward, it was outward going inward um, at the Red River Meeting House. Uh, and it, it led to, um, again, as we see in the history here, uh, moving towards um, the Second Great Awakening. Church historians would say about Red River Meeting House as people would continue to talk and post Second Great Awakening. If any of you grew up in, here in uh, Tennessee, you're familiar of E.M. Bounds, and you'd speak about that in the Great Prayer Revival in Franklin. I grew up in the uh, Spring Hill, Franklin area. Um, they would say uh, in that book, uh, Religion in the American South, that around this time, uh, the church leaders traded or, or uh, changed revival as liturgy into revival as experience. So you had a whole lot more people wanting to get the experience. Uh, to Josh's point, we gotta, we're we going to make a revival. Uh, Chan made a sermon. Actually, I think me and you were both at Exponential Tray when Chan gave a sermon about uh, man-made moves, waves of God, and kind of like a... Uh, kind of like a wave pool. We just click a button trying to get everyone to come and repent, but that's not how a uh, mighty wave of God works. Um, Holy Spirit uh, moves, and we're, we're here for the ride kind of thing. Um, but for, at least in this historical moment, um, they uh, saw it as liturgy. Uh, we come in, the work of the people, uh, but somewhere in that uh, time frame, it moved to just experience where the churches, uh, more evangelism was being just done in the, the church walls. Evangelism wasn't really being done out in the neighborhoods because that was the only place that you're going to experience revival uh, as opposed to liturgy amongst the work of the people. So, yeah. Each of these things we could talk a long time about. The Azusa Street Revival wasn't widely accepted by the body of Christ because of theology, but the, the historian in me wanted to acknowledge it. The Jesus Movement, uh, late 60s, through the um, Calvary Chapel into the Vineyard Movement. But it's interesting because when uh, um, our, our famous brother who comes once a year at, um, I can't, Ray Ortland, um, you know, he's always talking about the Jesus Movement and he's not, 
necessarily in the charismatic camp. And, and, and so that's always interesting that that did touch beyond the charismatics. And then, then in the last kind of 50 plus years, uh, there was the Asbury revival in 70, and then a couple of other charismatic Pentecostal revivals that weren't, weren't widely accepted by the whole body of Christ, but historically they're there. And then 2023. One of the reasons I think that the Asbury is a good place for a revival is like, you know, they're kind of safe. You know, everybody, you know, everybody, non-Pentecostals and charismatic people can like, okay, we can handle Asbury and the Baptist people can handle Asbury and they're conservative Methodists. So they, they kind of fall geographically and, uh, you know, not only geographically in our country, but within all of our different Christian cultures. Asbury always falls in a nice little place. Uh, the holiness people, the Nazarenes and Wesleyans like them. All, everyone likes Asbury. They're, they're like on everybody's positive list. That's so a good place for the Lord to move. What else? I mean, we, we don't really have time to talk about all these, um, but is there something I'm missing that just you say, hey, I'd like to put something else on the list? I know there is. So I just, I just want to remind us, uh, those of us who preach, that the sermon that was preached that day uh, the young man who spoke it considered it a stinker and said that it was, uh, you know, he was texted his wife, I'll, I'll be home later. Another stinker, I'll be home later, you know. And one of the threads you find historically with revivals is that it comes through the normal means of preaching and praying and praising as the church is gathered to do that. It's, it's not a manufactured or worked up you know, we're going to put all these elements together, and there it will there it will happen. It 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 is a uh, you know the old guys talked about sovereign visitation, um, and it, it happens through normal means of the church gathered. Uh, but it, what a what an encouragement to those of us who preach yes. that it the response of repentance uh, that that took off in that chapel space was after a sermon where the speaker himself thought, oh, I'm just going to go home and wish I never did this again. You know, <laughs> it's good. Thanks for bringing that. That is such great encouragement. I think it's also noteworthy that these revivals, if we really dug into them and had the time to, they're around places where people are gathered around Scripture and studying the Word, uh, especially those who that have a great great reputation so it, thanks for sharing that. that that's such an important so I'll answer the next question for the sake of time it is revival temporary or sustainable to me I think that based off the biblical examples and based on on these more recent 300 years historical examples I do think revival is a wave and then we go back to process and, and I think that's pastors it's good to help pastor people through that um, that, that's my perspective, that's my opinion, and, and we can go down there a little further, or we can push, we only got about 10 minutes here, so let me just bring up a couple of points. Why do people desire revival? Uh, I think that's already been addressed through several people talking today. Why is there resistance to revival? Maybe we'll talk about that in a second, okay? And are some drawn to, to revival more than others? And is it okay if you're not drawn to revival? I'm going to say yes. I think that that we have mystics, and we, we just have people who just are just just are maybe called by the Lord to pray for this, and and it's just their their thing. And I think that's good and helpful. But the story, if you read Christianity Today's reports on revival, there's a whole group of people who are managing revival, okay? I mean, so there are logistics, feeding people, putting people in line, restricting who can be there, kicking out the guy who blew the shofar. Some guy showed up and blew the shofar as at the revivals here, and he, they had to kick him off campus. Logistics with, logistics with the policemen, Logistics with the class schedule, policies on on the academic schedule. So, I just think there's some people that are like, "I gotta be there," 
I got to have the experience. And we need those people, and we need them to bring it back. I almost went the third day, but I only went, I realized I was going kind of for selfish reasons. Again, I referred to myself as this historian three or four times. I'm really not. I just like church history. I just wanted, I really wanted to go just to say I was there and just to kind of look around. I wasn't going because I was hungry for God, and I was okay because I was actually in a good place spiritually. I've had a good year of my process with the Lord, waking up in his presence every day, meeting the Lord every day. And I, in my estimation, I kind of think our church is vibed. We don't need a revival because we've got some, we've got some stuff going on every week. That's just, that's just my experience. I wanted to go, and, I, and I'd already made a commitment if I went. I was not, not going to put it on social media. But I wanted to go just to see, just so on, on a day like this, I could say I was there, you know. But I know another one of my good friends in Iowa who I respect drove down from Iowa, and, like, he needed it. He, he's a mystic. He's a worshiper. He's a, he just, he just, you could just, his given his report, you could just feel that, whew, I mean, he just needed it. Gordon, man, just went to this place right here on the same carpet we shared that I just, he, Gordon, you took me there with you. Just, I was there with you as you told that story. And so I think both are good. So who's called to manage revival? So I'll tell you this is that as a pastor, I don't believe you should ever have a prayer meeting revival service without a spiritual governor in the room. So when people say, hey, we want to have a prayer service, I want to know who's in charge. Who's going to kick out the shofar guy, right? Who's going to say, hey, the, the, the teenage boy and girl who have been embraced for 15 minutes and there's no space between them, break them up, okay? So, so you have to have this sense of, of, of spiritual leadership and shepherding. And, and I just have great compassion on the, the president of Asbury. Um, he, he was put in a, I mean, it was the Lord's work. And I think from what I know, he did a good job, but he had a lot of factors to consider. I talked to a, a young lady in our church yesterday who's an Asbury graduate. She went up there. She told me all of the story, Christian, I don't, know, I don't know if you knew that. She told me all the stories and there was a story of healing that I had not heard. Amazing story. A guy was healed of cancer right in front of her and all this. And she was just, I mean, just couldn't be as, she, she could not have been more enthusiastic. I said, well, this whole thing just ended. Why did it end? So then she shifted gears totally and said, well, having lived there in Wilmore, the infrastructure couldn't handle it. Like, literally, we only have two lights the police department was for us, you know, they didn't have enough man hours there. The EMS didn't know how they could get to people because the roads were clogged. Um, and, and so she went along that line. And so she was, as much as she had this amazing experience, uh, simultaneously, her perspective, and she went on for some time explaining how logistically uh, they weren't in the position to sustain it. A um, couple of other thoughts, because we're out of time. What role did social media play in the current revival? I think that's something we need to keep our eyes on uh, because even, um, and, and I'm not endorsing these revivals at all, but I just, just from a historical standpoint, following the 94, 95 Toronto Blessing and Pensacola revivals, they happen, and then the magazines had to print the article, and the article had to ship them to the, ship them to the churches, and then the pastors had to decide whether or not they were going to endorse it. And then the word started spreading among the people. So it took weeks for the word to get out. This took minutes for the word to get out. Christianity Today, again, as you can go read this article, after this, this man gave this uh, teaching that Cole referred to, 19 people stayed and prayed. One of the young men left, went to his classroom, came back out, heard singing. And so there was a group of, of young men who interrupted classes saying, revival's here, revival's here. As so the students ran there, and that's how everything started. And that afternoon, in the back room, seven or eight people with a whiteboard planning, how long should we keep the, church, the, the chapel open? 
you know, it's a, all of this logistics. And as pastors, these are things uh, hopefully we'll have to deal with, right? Because people are so hungry with the Lord. I hope that the things I'm bringing up, for those of you who are pastors, will position you to manage revival. And for those of you who may be in a position where you're not in a governing role, you'll have compassion for those who do have to govern and do have to make decisions for the whole church. But I see that the speed of spread through social media also made it have a speed of closure. If we would have allowed the students to have this move of God and the faculty to manage it, could it still be going on in Wilmore? Thank God it's at Texas A&M now, other colleges. I had, I noticed this, that we had two, two kind of polar opposites. You had students and young adults who went and then senior citizens who went. I'm like, in the 2020s, do people in their late 20s through early 40s who have jobs and kids to get to school, is revival for them anymore? Or is it going to be polarized? So someone said this. They said, you know, hey, for that college revival, I know I sound like a cynic here, and, and forgive me, Gordon, but I'm just giving us different perspectives. There sure were a lot of gray heads there for that college revival, that whole thing. It's something to think about. Like, it, here's my point. I'm not trying to introduce cynicism here. I'm trying to help us think strategically. The, the social media, yes, it caused the spread of this message with speed, but it may have simultaneously squelched it with, with, with speed because it wasn't that organic prayer movement. It was may, may, just something to think about, something to think about. Again, I think Asbury, even geographically where it's located, we know this from Middle Tennessee, Lexington, uh, Nashville, 75% of our country can get here in a day's drive. So it would have been much different in the state of Washington. You know, so, so th- those are some of the dynamics. Um, and so anyway, th- those are some of my thoughts. So I just wanted, you know, um, Mauricio this morning, he told me, he's like, Aaron, you're not going to get past the first three questions. And you were kind of right. But I just want to introduce his thoughts. Having said that, let me close with a more positive more positive. Within 48 hours, talking with Beth, talking with our pastoral team, I I immediately put something positive to our church, to social media, that this is a good thing. Asbury is a good thing. Jesus is a good thing at Asbury. (laughs) And, and And I hope, and I'm optimistic that it could be the catalyst to more prayer and more activity around the churches. And I'm called to pastor and shepherd. Now, I, I will say this. I was a little bit frustrated because we had a week of prayer in January with, with less than 2% of our church who attended, 3% of our church attended. And so that, that part, I had to work through the emotions of that. But the Lord helped me realize this, that I'm going to call, I'm going to shepherd, I'm going to pastor no matter what. I'm going to pastor revival because we have to pastor revival. And I'm going to pastor the dry times too. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to be there both. So, so I hope today can, I hope you can still leave with some optimism and some excitement. And we need that kind of, woo yes, Lord. I mean, I need that, you know, to get us through, but wisdom on how to manage that and reproduce it. And man, wouldn't that be great if a month from now we came back here and said, can you believe that talk we had a month ago? Now we have it five different places, 10 different places in America, and uh, an outpouring, a swelling up is happening. Just like me and Jeremy uh, had that talk. Oh, yeah, let, let's, talk with, let's talk with Pastor Rose about what happened 52 years ago, 53 years ago. We didn't have to because something happened two weeks later. So I pray that my little discussion with you guys is obsolete 30 days from now, right? But what, what, what won't be obsolete is maybe the wisdom that, that maybe I hope that the Lord's helped us. I learned a lot from you guys today. And th- thank you guys for our Missouri bunch. I, I feel great thoughts on the tip of your tongue. We'll get, it, we'll, we'll get a coffee here. So I'll go ahead and close. Look, look at that. Look at that. Look at him. He's like raring to get the mic. You want to close us in prayer, brother? Oh, you just, just let me know it's time, right? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I did go over four minutes, and that, I don't do that Girl. typically. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray a blessing over uh, this house of worship. 
over the Axis Church, over their elders here, Pastor Jeremy and his team of elders who are leading this church. I pray your blessing over this place. And I pray in all the places we worship that, Lord, we would have sensitive hearts to your Holy Spirit, ready for the outpouring of the Spirit and faithful with the process. God, we want to be people who are open to God experiences, but who are faithful to the process that, that you have shown us. We're faithful in every season. So, Lord, help us to be both people of process, but people of experience too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.